I'm just curious, this is just as a way of getting to know you guys. Um, how many of you guys would describe yourself as you're, you're a risk taker? Well, like through and through, you're a risk taker. Okay, okay. A few of us, you just need to know the rest of us think that you're crazy. Right? And that's not a nog. That, that, that's just a reality. Uh, the rest of you guys, I assume, would, would, would call yourself risk averse. Uh, the truth of the matter, though, is that's a much more complex discussion because um, even for the risk averse, that there are certain things that we will take risks on. Um, you might say, well, what have I ever taken a risk on? Well, you might be sitting next to them. <laughs> or they may be back in life, kids, right? Right? Um, we can laugh at that, right? Right? Marriage is a risk. Having kids is a risk. So even the risk averse, it's like, okay, if I think the payoff is good, then, then I'll take a risk. Um, and even for the risk takers, the truth of the matter is that there are lines that, 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 we, that we simply won't cross. And so the reality is we tend to define ourselves in one area or another, but, but the truth is a lot more complex. But one thing that's true about all of us is this. All of us have lines that we say, I won't, I won't do that thing. I, I won't do you know, this, this one thing. I may do a lot of other things things, but, but not that. And so here's just a few for me. Um, you couldn't pay me enough money to go swimming like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean because Jaws lives there. And you might say that the sharks don't eat people a lot. Like they, they, they will eat people. And I'm just, I'm just not tempted to throw myself in the ocean and say, hey, come get me or whatever. Don't like swimming in the ocean. I will never jump out of an airplane. I don't, I, I don't care if there's a parachute on my back or a really good bungee cord attached to my ankles. I'm not jumping out of something that, that it's like, just fall. Like, 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 I don't understand. Like, some of y'all folks, why would y'all do that? I, I, I really, I don't understand. Um, I don't even really like walking through the woods unless there's like a clear path because snakes live there. Right? Does anybody relate to me on that little the snake thing? Thank you. Great, great. I, I appreciate that. So, so there are some things that, that I, I, I just simply don't want to do. And one thing I really don't want to do, but maybe it'll happen someday, and maybe y'all are praying this won't happen. Um, I have two boys. I'm praying to God that they don't grow, that as they grow older, and maybe we go to a theme park or something, they're not like, Daddy, I want to ride that, and I want you to go with me. Because, because, and if they do, if they do, I've already figured it out. I will just close my eyes and pray for the rapture. That's what I'll do. I'll just close my eyes because I've done the roller coaster thing, and I've learned if you close your eyes, it's just kind of a really rough rocking chair. You know, as long as you don't have the visual thing going on, it's, it, it's kind of okay. Um, and we can laugh about stuff like that, right? Like, like none of those are really all that serious. Um, but but it's, it's very, very different, however, um, when you start talking about kind, kind of being forced into a situation that you didn't really have an option to get into. Well, like at the end of the day, we talk about taking a lot of risk. Uh, you know, like it's one thing to say, hey, I, th I think I'm going to drop everything I'm doing, drop the stable job I have, and do a career change because it's something I'm passionate about. Well, like it's one thing to kind of like take that risk on your own. It is quite another thing to just be minding your own business and then your company decides to downsize and they're like, we're cutting you loose in 30 days. That's it. That's a very different situation when you're forced into something that carries risk and, and you didn't have anything to do with it. It, it, it's one thing to like pursue somebody in a dating relationship and then marry them. And at the end of the day, when you stand at the altar, you have no idea how things are going to go. But, but it's one thing to take that risk. It's another thing to have to work through, through, through betrayal in a relationship, right? That you had nothing to deal with, nothing to do with. That, that's very, very different. It's one thing to say, hey, let's, let's start a family because that sounds fun, right? They never, well, they tell you about the sleep deprivation. It's, it's real. Um, but, man, it's quite another thing when, when, man, one of your kids develops a medical condition that, that it's going to it's, it's be within the rest of their life. Like, like that's, that's a much different thing. So, man, here's the question I want us to, to think about, whether you're risk-averse or a risk-taker or, or, or somewhere in between. Um, what do you do when God leads you into a situation that, 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 is, that is kind of risk-filled, and, and you had no choice over the matter. Like, it wasn't up to you. you God just kind of led you to that spot in life. What do you do with that? What do you do when, when God leads you into a situation to where you're like, I had no control over this. I never would have chosen this path. And more than that, it, it doesn't seem like there's any clear way out. What do you do when you end up there? 
And you start wondering, God, what in the world are you doing? Like, 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 why would you lead me into this place to where I don't have clear answers? I don't have a clear solution. I never would have chosen to be here on my own. Like, 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 like what in the world are you doing? What do you do? So we're going to look at a, at a story from Scripture. It's not just a story. It's real life. And you might say, well, why do you believe it? Well, because Jesus talked about it like it was real life. And I think if you can predict your resurrection, then you're pretty credible. But Exodus chapter 12 is where we start. Just some background on this a little bit. We're going to look at uh, the story of the people of Israel being brought out of slavery in Egypt. If you've been in church all your life, like you know this story. If, if you haven't been in this is new, let me just give you the background. Um, the nation of Israel came from this guy named Jacob, who God renamed Israel, and he had 12 kids. And, and at one point, there was a famine in the place where they were living, and so they moved to Egypt. There were 70 of them at that time. And they stay in Egypt for about 400 years. That They grow in number. They grow to be about around 2 million people or so. And somewhere in that time, the Egyptian ruler, Pharaoh, decides they would make great slaves. And he, so he enslaves the, um, the Israelite people. And so at some point in that 400-year period, they become slaves and most likely they've been slaves at this point in the story for, for several hundred years. Now, now, just imagine you've been waiting for something for years and it's treacherous and it's painful um, and it just hadn't happened. Like, that, that's, that, that's my second one. He's got some lungs. Wow. Um, <laughs> and that's true. He does. He does. Uh, I can never tell when my first was crying when he was back there, but my second one, wow. Um, <laughs> Let me get my brain back to where I was thinking. Yeah, okay. So they've, so they've been waiting for hundreds of years in slavery, waiting for things to change. Um, that's challenging, right? When you've got a situation in your life that you desperately wanted to change, you've got no control over it changing, though, right? And the longer and the longer and longer it goes, man, it just gets discouraging, right? Now just imagine that, that you're in a situation that I mean, your parents hoped it would change, and, their grand, and your grandparents hoped it would change, and your great-parents and your great-great-grandparents and your great-great-great-grandparents hoped it would change. But, man, you're five generations down, and you're still living in the same thing. You're no longer ho you're no, there, there's no longer hope in that situation. Like, it just feels kind of hopeless. And it'd be very easy in that situation to think, man, has God just forgot about me? In fact, maybe some of you guys are there right now that maybe you're working through something or maybe someone you love is working through something and, and it just doesn't seem to get better and you're just wondering, man, God, have you just forgotten about me? But here's the good news. Um, man, God doesn't forget about us. Because after 430 years, God calls an 80-year-old guy named Moses, which, by the way, if, if you're on the other side of 50, like, like your best days can actually be ahead of you. Right, like, like we live in a culture that's like you got to be young and charismatic. But the truth of the matter is, the older you get, like some of God's best work will be through in your like sunset years in life. Because that's what happens through Moses. Moses is 80 years old. God's like, hey, I want you to go to Egypt. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses has all these doubts, but God says, you're not getting out of it. You're going. And so God sends Moses. Um, God sends 10 plagues on the Egyptians. Eventually, the Egyptians let the people of Israel go. And so we pick up the story, Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 31. It says, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country for otherwise they said we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders and kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and watch this. They asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, there were about 600,000 men on foot. Besides women and children, that's where we get there. There was at least around 2 million people. Many other people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, flocks, and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare the food themselves. Then verse 40 says, The length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years to the very day... All the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. So this is the story of Israel being brought out of Egypt. And, and, and if you're an Israelite living in that time, 
That officially qualifies as awesome because you've been waiting for this thing your whole life. You thought it would never happen, and then bang, it happens, and it's awesome. It sort of reminds me of the Atlanta Braves winning the World Series last year. Any, any Atlanta Braves fans in here besides me? Like, okay, a few people, yes, awesome. Because we won it in 1995, and I was like eight years old, and I didn't think we'd win anything else ever again. Kind of like a North Carolina State fan, right? Like, like, we'll never win anything else ever again, and it's, it's just, it just is what it is. Um, you know, but, um, but man, then it finally happened this year. We won the World Series, and it's like, man, this is unbelievable. And will I be happy the rest of my life? I don't know, maybe for the next 20 years or so. I don't know. Um, but, man, when you're waiting on something and then it happens, that's awesome, man. And talking about a sports team winning something is really lighthearted. But, man, think about something very different in your life, like a, like a watershed moment in your life. You waited for something. You weren't sure it was ever going to happen. And then it happened. And this is the story of most guys getting married, right? Right, guys? Because we know deep down inside that nobody would ever, ever really want to marry us. And then it happened, right? And so, but this happens for the Israelites. This is a big deal. This thing that they hoped for, um, that they didn't think would ever happen. Man, it happens. God brings them out of slavery. They're free. And then we pick up the story that goes down a little further into chapter um, 13, verse 17. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. And that makes sense, right? Like you've been through a really hard time. Let's, let's, let's not get into war right immediately. That seems to make sense. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. So God takes them on the long route, right? Like, 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 the, like the scenic route. And it seems like that's okay, right? Because they're not going to face war, that sort of thing. Um, but then it gets really, really interesting for the people of Israel. Chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near uh, a word that I'm not even going to try to say, um, between Migdal and the sea, there to encamp by the sea directly opposite Balzaphon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And then watch this. And I, watch this. God says that he would harden Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh will pursue you. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the, king of Pharaoh, of the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near something, um, opposite Belzephon. And by, by the way, the only reason I'm not saying that is because I don't know how to confidently pronounce that. Usually I just confidently pronounce it, but this one is a tongue twister for me. So, um, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And watch this. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So the Israelites are led by God away from war, but right into this situation where they have a huge military force coming after them, they're hemmed in by the sea, and there's no way out, and they're so despondent and distressed over this, they're like, well, what was the only reason God got us out of this? Was it to kill us in the desert? Like, at least if we were slaves, we'd still be alive. And now we're in this situation that God put us in. There's no way out. There's no way forward. What in the world are we supposed to do. And this is a situation some of us find us ourselves in uh, today. We find ourselves in a situation that we had nothing to do with. We didn't choose to go this way, but God brought us this way and now has put us in a situation where there's no good options, no clear way through. And it just makes us wonder, man, God, what in the world are you doing? Like, why did you do it like this? And it makes us wonder, um, God, like, it, like, I just don't understand what you're doing. And I've been there. I've been there so many times, particularly when it's come uh, to starting this church. There, there have been so many moments where I've just wondered, well, man, is this the moment where things just kind of go belly up and that's it? 
Because so often, just to be honest, and maybe some of you can relate to this, so often, even when God's opened a door and it's like, oh yes, God opened a door through this really hard thing. It seems to have like about that much space on the other side of it. And then there's a cliff. And it's like, well, God, I appreciate you opening the door, but uh, there, there's this cliff in front of me. And I'm not really sure what to do. And there seems to be no way forward. There seems to be no way out. I'm, I'm stuck in this place. What do I do? And we could talk about several different things, and we will. But I would say one of the first things we need to realize is this, when we're in a situation that God has put us in, that there's no way out, there doesn't seem to be any way forward, and, it, and it's a place so not of our choosing. We have to realize this to start with. It's, it's this. If God calls me to it, he will carry me through it. If God's brought me to this place, then he really is going to carry me through it. And I may, I may not see the answers, and I may not see the options, and I, I may not see anything in front of me, but God really will carry me through it. And we can believe that really just based on the cross and the empty tomb. Because Jesus already did the most difficult thing for us imaginable because the Israelites were facing the Red Sea with no way forward, but all of us are stuck in sin with no way back to God. Separated from God by our sin and no amount of good works and no amount of religious activity will ever get us back to God Which is why Jesus came to earth lived the perfect life We couldn't live died the death We should have died on a cross and came back to life so that through him we're no longer stuck in sin We have a way back to God when we repent of our sin and give Jesus Christ control of our life And so he's already taken care of that He's already made a way for us to get out of, out of sin which has eternal implications and here's the thing if God loved us enough to make a way for us to be saved for eternity, don't you think he'll just as easily take care of these other things in our life? Because compared to the sin issue, well, I, like there's literally nothing else in our life that remotely compares to that. Because the most difficult thing for us is, is having our sin forgiven. It's having our sin dealt with. It's having a way for us as imperfect people to come back into relationship with a holy God. Well, Jesus already took care of making that possible. And if he did that, he'll take care of these other things. If he calls us to it, he'll carry us through it. But that does beg the question of, okay, well, then why does it have to be so difficult? We feel this way over different things, right? Right? Like, like what, why, why does this have to be so difficult? And, and the answer for that is, is really simply this. And this won't be on the screen, but, but I think it's worth jotting down. Um, an easy life does not produce strong faith. An easy life does not produce strong faith. I mean, we know this from like an exercise perspective, right? If all you ever do is curls with two and a half pound dumbbells, I mean, no, nobody's going to look at you and be like, I want that body, right? And, and listen, if that's all you can curl, that's not a knock on you. That's not a knock, okay? Some of us are just limited like, like, or whatever. Um, like myself, I have long arms, and so it's hard for me to curl a lot, a lot of weight. Guys with short arms, all they have to do is this right here. It's like, no, no, well, no, wonder, you can, no wonder you can curl like 100 pounds. You got to move it like three inches, right? Or some of these guys that bench press 500. It's like, yes, I could probably do it if I had to move it six inches too, you know? Um, but in general, to get stronger, what's required? Well, you've got to put more weight on it. You have to have more resistance. And that's really what God is doing in our lives when he leads us to these places where there's no obvious way forward. He's strengthening our faith. He's making it stronger. He's making it better. He's making it deeper. Could it be, let me just go off on a tangent for a second. Could it be that so many times the reason that people under 20 are leaving the church in droves is because we've obsessed over having an easy life and there's no faith that's strong enough that makes them say, I want that. Because we're obsessed with a middle-class Christianity that really removes risk, and that absolutely builds zero faith. And they're like, well, this doesn't seem to be a huge component of my parents' life, so why should I even make it a component of my life? So God puts us in these situations to strengthen our faith, and what he's really doing is this. You can write this down. God is teaching us to trust him with the next step. He's teaching us to trust him with the next step. Why is he putting us in a place 
where, where there's no way forward for us, there's no options, it's because he's teaching us to trust him to take care of it. And if we keep moving as he says for us to move, that's how, we, that's how our faith in him is strengthened. And I will say this about the next step. Well, whatever your next step happens to, to be, whether that's you need to give your life to the Lord or you need to go public through baptism or, or you need to start serving or trusting God with your finances or start getting connected with other people in a relationship or deal with a forgiveness issue in your past or start reconciling a marriage or, or whatever else it happens to be, maybe dealing with trauma from your past. Man, whatever else it is, whatever that next step is that God has in front of you right now that you need to trust him with, here's what I can promise to you. It will be the easiest step he calls you to the rest of your life because the next steps are always harder. You might say, that, that doesn't sound great. But it's, it's true. It's true. Like, like, like for instance, um, looking back on it now that, now that we're five and a half years into LifeSpring Church, um, the easiest decision in this whole process was, was to start it. That was the easy decision. To, to leave a stable uh, job at another church and, and jump into this with, with no guarantees and, and no budget, no building, and no anything, just saying, okay, God, Yes. It's gotten exponentially harder on top of that. And so I know, like, like, wherever you happen to be right now, I know that step seems difficult, but guess what? There are greater steps of faith that God wants you to take down the road, and he's training you to take those by taking the step you have right now. You'll never get to the step he wants to take you on down the road until you're like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with the one right in front of me right now. But you got to trust him. So I want to spend the rest of the morning talking about what does trust look like what does trust look like? Three ideas, they'll all be on the screen. You can jot them down. The first one is this. Don't stand still and wait on God when God has said to step forward. Don't stand still and wait on God when God has said step forward. Here, here's what we're really good about as Christians. We're great procrastinators. Because what we'll say is this. Well, I'm praying about it and I'm just waiting on God. And, and let me be really clear. That is not a knock on prayer. We, we should pray. We should pray way more than we plan. And you should wait on God. You should seek God's will. But man, so often we use that line, I'm praying about it or I'm waiting on God to procrastinate what God has already put in front of us. And what we do in the process is we convince ourselves to just keep kicking the can, kicking the can. I did this with baptism for like two and a half years. Like I knew you're supposed to get baptized after salvation by immersion. Gave my life to Christ in 2008, um, and every time baptism came up, man, there's just it's not in the pit of my stomach, and I'm like, I wish I wouldn't talk about this. And it's like, well, I already got baptized as a kid. It's okay. But every single time, it's like, no, you need to do it after salvation, by immersion, because that's the way Scripture calls us to do it. And I kept kicking the can. I kicked the can down the road for almost three years, till finally the Lord got a hold of me. I was like, okay. And what made it really interesting was I was on church staff by the time I decided to take that step, before I was finally obedient to what God said. But interestingly enough, I can go back to that step, and in the aftermath of that step, God opened up a, a, a much more effective season of ministry for me. Don't procrastinate where God has already said move. In fact, watch, what, uh, watch this interaction between Moses and the Lord here in chapter 14. Verse 13, it says, Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm. In other words, be still. And you'll see the deliverance of the Lord, the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never see again. You'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then God speaks up. He says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through on dry ground. Notice this. God told Israel to start moving before Moses was used by God to part the Red Sea. Now think about if you're Moses in that, stand pool, in that place, you're like, move on. You mean into the water. Into the water. You, you want us to move into the water. There's nowhere to go. Into the water. But that's such an interesting exchange where Moses is like, just be still. Everything will be okay. And God's like, no, get moving. Go on. Get moving. And then as you move, I'll use you to make a way where there isn't one. But you can't just be still. Or you'll stall out. And that's what happens to a lot of us, right? Like, 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 like we overanalyze something to death or, or we pray about something uh, to make a decision that we're going to make in six months anyway. And we just think about it and think about it and think about it and think about it. And, and, we, and we stall out. 
And for some of us, that's why our faith has become very, very anemic. Because we are moving in the right direction, we are moving forward, and you can blame it on the last two years of COVID and shutdowns or whatever, or blame it on something else, I don't know. But the reality is, as soon as you stop moving when God says go, you stall out. And here, here, here's the really, uh, um, I would say, spiritually dangerous thing. The longer you are stalled out, the more difficult it is to get moving. So I'll say this, and, and, and maybe this applies to somebody in the room. I don't know. It, it may, may certainly apply to you if you're online. It's this. Um, if you're still in the season where you're like, well, I'll eventually get back into the habit of gathering with the church every single week. And right now it's just kind of occasional or, or it's just online still, but I'll eventually get back into it. Listen, the longer you maintain that posture, the more difficult it's going to be for you to get back into it. Don't stall out. And if you've got a next step that God has put in front of you right now, just baptism, for instance, that just comes up because, I don't know, the Holy Spirit brings it up, I don't know. Um, the longer you kick that cane down the road, the harder it's going to be to take that step. Don't stall out by staying still where God has already said to step forward. In a nutshell, when God speaks, get moving. Number two, second thing is this. Trust is about God being glorified as I step forward. It's about God being glorified. This is dealing with the issue of our motive. And, and all of us have had this following situation, right? Like somebody does something really nice for us and we're touched, right? We're like, man, that was kind. And then comes the ask, right? It's like your teenager's like, I'm going to clean the house. And you're like, they're finally getting some responsibility. And then they're like, hey, uh, by the way, I know my curfew is 10 o'clock, but can I make it 1 a.m. on Saturday? And then you're like, oh, mm-hmm. You weren't actually being nice. You were just trying to butter me up. Your, 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 your actions may have seemed like they were in the right place, but your motive was just wrong. Now, now y'all parents, don't be too hard on your teenagers sitting next to them, right? Right? Because y'all do that with each other's spouses, right? Right, right, right. Ner ner nervous laughter, nervous laughter. But man, we can end up doing the same thing with God. And, and, and this is one of the ways that, um, that, man, that, 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 this is one of the reasons why it's so important to, 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 to know God's voice and to know God's word. Because cause if we don't, um, man, we can maybe start to take things like that seem like steps of faith, but, but it's actually about us. In fact, watch this, verse 17 here. God says, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. And then he says, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. If any human being were, say, were to say this, it would be egocentric. But since God is God, God has every right to say, it's about my glory. And by the way, actually the most loving thing for God to ever say is it's about his glory. Because his glory is what led him to go to the cross. Is it about saving us? Sure. Is it about his love for us? Sure. But most of all, it is about God being glorified through his love and his justice and his grace and his mercy being perfectly displayed in the work and person of Jesus Christ on the cross and through the empty tomb. It's about God's glory. And so here's a question I, I think we really ought to wrestle with. Um, Who are you really wanting to glorify with your life? When, when, when it comes to God calling you to a next step, man, who, who is it really all about? Like, like, what's the motive there? Is it about how you look or is it about how God looks? And by the way, when it's about how we look, that is one of the biggest things that keeps us from taking the next step that God calls us to. Because when we're concerned about how we look and what other people think about us, um, man, we will stall out big time. Because we're like, well, man, what happens if I take this step and it doesn't work out? But see, that's actually the wrong thinking. Because if it's about God's glory, then the goal is not the result. The goal is obedience because it's the obedience that glorifies God regardless of what the result is. And you might say, so you mean I could take a step that God genuinely calls me to take and it looks like I fail? Yes, 
because the goal is not the result. The goal is obedience to God and his voice. Which is why it is so important to be able to discern God's voice. Because when God leads us to these places that that we don't have answers and there don't seem to be any options, but he says move forward, we won't have all the answers. And so it is crucial for us to know whether it's God speaking or it's last night's pizza. So how do you know whether it's God's voice? Four quick ideas. Um, Won't be on the screen, but you can jot them down. Um, God's word is the primary way he speaks. If you want to know what God has said, read his word. That, that's why when we talk about being with Jesus through his word, through prayer, man, you've got to devour the word of God. God's word clearly lays out what God has already said. It won't give us the answer for every single thing. Like if you're here and you're single and you're like, I wonder who I should marry. And you're like flipping around to see if there's a clear command in scripture, thou shalt marry Betty Sue. You won't find it. But you'll find plenty of things God has already said. And God is never going to contradict his word. Never going to contradict his word. The second thing, uh, the second way God speaks is through wise, godly people that are ahead of you on the journey. God will speak through other people. This is why this idea of connecting with other people is so, commu- is, is so important because you need other people in your life that, that you can bounce ideas off of or, or speak to that can help you discern, man, this, this is really something the Lord wants you to do, which is why if you're a lady, there's a ladies Bible study here every other Tuesday night, and you can talk to our Life Kids Director, Stephanie, if you want info about that. And if you're a guy, we're going to be doing a guys group on Thursday mornings at 6 a.m. starting this Thursday. Um, but man, the point of that is not the content. The point of that is relationship. Because some of the most important steps God has ever led me to, I was able to have the courage to take them because somebody else said, yes, I think that's a good idea. I think that's exactly where the Lord is leading you. So you got God's word, you got other people, um, your circumstances. God will speak to you through your circumstances. The, the, The way he structures things in your life right now, God will speak to you through your circumstances. And fourth, he'll speak to you through the Holy Spirit. You can hear God speak, not necessarily audibly, but but in your heart. And you might say, well, how do I know it's God? Line it up between what has God's word said, what have other wise godly people said, what do my circumstances say? Because if you feel like God is telling you one thing, but his word says something else, and other people say something else, and your circumstances say something else, probably not God. So we've got to be able to discern the voice of the Lord to identify, okay, is God telling me to move? Yes. And we've got to be able to discern the voice of the Lord also for him to cut through our motives and to figure out, man, who who is this really about? And we talked a little about about the negative side of it, like, like if we're so concerned with what other people think, we can tend to hold back on taking steps. But in the positive sense, even in taking steps that God calls us to, man, we got to be so careful that our ego doesn't get wrapped up in that. And, and just to be honest, on a personal level, um, man, it can be so hard for me to sometimes disentangle. Where, where, where does a genuine desire for God's glory begin and, and a desire for Dylan's glory end? And those lines can get really, really blurry sometimes, just to be honest. And so you've got to be able to hear what God is saying. You've got to be in his word. You've got to be in relationship with others. You've got to understand your circumstances so that you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, whether he's saying, yes, go, or whether you're saying, hey, your motive needs to be changed. The third thing, what what does trust look like? Trust looks like... Moving when God says move, not sitting still. Trust looks like God being glorified as we step forward. But then trust, at the end of the day, it's this. Trust is about the display of God's power. This is the issue of who gets the credit. Who gets the credit for you taking that step? And so here's what happens next with with the people of Israel. Verse 19 It says, Then the angel of the Lord who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved moved from in front of them and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, 
And all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived, but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. That day, watch this, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed through the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Do you notice who the major actor is in that set of verses? It's God. The very, very minor part is Moses doing what God told him to do. The major part is God doing the acting. And that's why God leads us into these situations where it seems there's no way forward, there's no way through, so that we'll understand as we take steps, man, God's the one who did it. Not me. It wasn't my planning. It wasn't my ingenuity. It wasn't because I figured it out. It was because God made it happen. So here's an example, a really recent story uh, from my life and, and the life of our church. Um, back in last, uh, last July or last August, we made the decision to, to sell the house we were living in. Um, and I was just thinking about that. Uh, we, we have always given. We, we, we tithe off of everything God gives us. Um, that's not necessarily biblical that if you've sold a house and haven't tithed on it that you have to. We just find it to be a healthy practice. God gets the first and he gets the best. Um, and so that house was going to go for $260,000. And so my thought was like, man, $26,000 going to LifeSpring. That would be awesome. And about as soon as I had that thought, God's like, that's not going to LifeSpring. I'm like, Okay, that's fine. Here's what I didn't know. What I didn't know was that about two and a half months later, we were going to be in a situation where it's like, oh, we got to lay some people off. And we're in this really tight financial situation. And um, by the way, Dylan, in order for you to continue to be employed by the church, you're going to have to raise about 40% of your salary, which is about $18,000. And all that time I'm thinking, God, there's this chunk of money that I'm going to give. It'd be so much easier if I just give it here. It'll take care of everything. And God never let me out of it. God never let me off the hook for that. And so the house sold. We got the money in the bank. We wrote those checks to folks they were go-to. And, and, and I start on the fundraising trail of raising my own salary, um, or about 40% of it. And then the day after our Christmas gathering, I get a call from a guy. He's like, hey, um, God wants me to, to help contribute to that. And um, I want to give you $25,000 towards that. Now I wondered in the aftermath, I was like, God, wouldn't it just been simpler and a lot less stressful for me just to do the one instead of the other? And, and, and it would have been. But who gets the credit on the one hand? God does, not Dylan. See, if it had if it just been me writing a check, then, um, I don't know, maybe I'd been proud. Maybe I'd been like, well, I figured that out. That's okay. You know, it was a little tight maybe, but we, we had it taken care of. But the other way, it's very obviously God saying, no, no, I'm taking care of this. And you can't pat yourself on the back, and you can't take any credit because I figured it out. And I'll say this to um, there's so much more confidence in God figuring it out than you figuring it out. Because if you figure it out, then it's easy to wonder in the back of your mind, of, man, am I actually doing what God wants me to do? But when God figures it out and God puts his stamp of, of approval on it by opening a door that there was no, no way you could open, then that's like, man, I know I'm exactly where God wants me to be. On the one hand, there's an opportunity for Dylan to get credit there. If Dylan writes the check, but since Dylan didn't and God forced me into this other situation that forced me to humble myself and go to some people and say, hey, I've, I've got to raise um, support at this point in the life of our church. Um, God gets the credit. And that's just a better place to be. 
Because at the end of the day, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not about the display of our ingenuity or our plans or our strategic thinking or our ability to figure it out. It's about the display of God's ability to figure it out. So let's get real practical here for, for just a few moments. Um, here's a question to wrestle with. Uh, what's the next step I need to trust God with? What's the next step? Because chances are every single one of us in here, you, you, you've got a next step. What is it? Is, is it giving your life to Christ? Um, is it baptism? We've, t- we've talked about that a little bit. Baptism seems to be the one that really gets kicked down the road, by the way. That, that happens a lot. Um, may, maybe it's joining a volunteer team. I don't know. It's to start serving. Uh, maybe it is stepping into a relationship, whether that's through Sunny at the Lake, whether that's through Family Night to Night, uh, whether that's through our men's or our women's group. Um, getting into a relationship, that can be a big step. Um, Maybe it's starting to honor the Lord with your finances. Um, maybe, it, may, maybe it's this is another one where, that we kick down the road. Maybe it's somebody's got a beef against you, and you know they have a beef against you, but you've just kind of kicked the can, kicked the can. You're like, eh, I'm not, not really going to deal with that. Ignoring where God says, hey, if somebody has something against you, you need to, like, stop offering your gift. You need to go reconcile first. Maybe that's the next step, that you've got some unforgiveness you need to work through, and you need to initiate a conversation today to do that. Maybe it's reconciling a marriage. Um, maybe it's speaking up and saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to something, whether that's on a computer screen or in a bottle, um, and I need help. Maybe it's something as simple as just, just, just being back with the church every single weekend. What's the next step? Because I can tell you this, um, I found that it's really hard to go more than a few months without God putting something in front of me and like, hey, I want you to do this. Because... Walking with Jesus is a, is a journey, and it always is a series of next steps. So what's the next step God puts in front of you? What, what's the thing that God has in front of you right now that you're like, um, I don't really like being in this situation. Um, I don't really know what to do with this situation. I know there's a next step, um, but you're just kind of, kind of scared to take it maybe? Maybe it's this one, uh, one, one, one more good one maybe. Uh, maybe it's just wrestling with a calling. Man, God is calling you to something, and you're like, I'm not really so sure about that. But, but God has clearly put it in front of you, like, hey, this is your next step. What's the next step you need to trust God with? Because here's reality. Two, two big ideas to lay in the plane here. Um, if you're going to have a faith story, you must take steps of faith. If you're going to have a faith story, you must take steps of faith. And, and here's the lens I want to encourage you guys to listen, to, 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 to think through. Um, think about the stories you want to tell the next generation whether that's your kids, whether that's your grandkids. Um, if you don't have kids, whether, whether that's just people that, that, that are going to be younger when you're in your 60s, 70s. Man, what story do you want to tell the next generation? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few that, that, that I want to be able to tell the next generation. Um, I, I want to be able to tell my kids that, um, man, um, when God, when every single time God prompted my heart to say, hey, I want you to engage somebody in a conversation, even if it's just asking somebody if, you, if they need prayer, if it's, even if it's somebody you didn't know, um, I was obedient to what God said. I want to be able to tell my kids when they start working and, 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 and they're like, well, what do I do? do, do I, what do I give? And I'm like, well, I, I think you ought to tithe. I want to be able to tell them, man, every single time, even when finances were tight, me and your mama, we never backed off giving and God always provided. And it wasn't because we were geniuses, it's because God is our provider. I want to be able to tell my kids that, man, um, when God called me to this next step in ministry, whether that was getting into ministry to start with or, or applying for a job that I had no interest in, um, or starting a church, that, man, I said yes. And, and because I said yes, God was faithful in that. I want to be able to tell my kids there were moments that I had no idea what was going to happen, but I did what God told me to do in the moment where it was uncomfortable. And, man, God came through on that. I want to be able to tell my kids that, man, even when I thought I was in the absolute right, when there was somebody that, that I knew had something against me, I initiated a conversation. And we might not have been best friends on the other side of that, but man, we cleared the air and it takes a weight off of my soul. So what story do you want to be able to tell your kids? I don't think any of us want to be able to want to tell our kids, yeah, I knew this was my next step, but I kicked the can, I kicked the can. Man, live the type of story you want to tell the next generation. And I especially want to encourage you parents to do that. Live the type of story you want to tell the next generation that you want the next generation to live. And will it be kind of frightening? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, it will. Um, and the next steps always get harder. They always get more challenging. There's always more at stake. Um, but man, here's the last thing I've learned. It's this. Um, those who experience the Lord's supernatural action must take steps that require supernatural intervention. Now, that doesn't mean going and being stupid. That's why you have to know God's word. That's why you have to be in community with people. That's why you need to be able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why you have to be able to understand your circumstances. But those who experience the Lord's supernatural action must take steps that require supernatural intervention. Could it be that many times the reason we don't see the Lord act in miraculous ways in our lives is because we've got it all together? And we've got it all figured out. And we've got every T crossed and every I dotted. Um, and it almost plans God right out of it. If you're going to have a faith story, you've got to take steps of faith. And if you want to see the Lord come through in your life in ways that you cannot possibly imagine, guess what? You're going to have to let him lead you to some places that it requires divine intervention for you to get through it. And the truth is, that starts with salvation. Because if you're here in the room and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, the reality is you're already in that spot. Because you are stuck in this thing called sin. And it's something we're born with. It separates us from God. No amount of good works can bring us from, from being dead in our sin to being alive in Christ. It required supernatural intervention for us to have a way to come back to God. And that is why Jesus came to this earth. It's why he lived a perfect life. It's why he died the death we should have died. And it's why he rose again. Because apart from the work of Christ, we have no hope and no way back to God. But God, God figured that out. It through the person, the work of Jesus Christ. And in the exact same way, like, like, like that's the start of our story, stepping into, into a relationship with Christ because Jesus did for us that what we could not do on our own. Um, but the truth is, every single step after that is stepping into the reality that, okay, God's got to make it happen. It's not going to be my ingenuity. It's not going to be my ability. It's not going to be my capability. It's going to be God doing it. Guys, I live that story every single time I stand here, up here on the stage because I had no desire to preach. When, God, when I started feeling God called me to ministry, my response was, well, I'll drum because I can do that, but I, I know he'd never call me to preach because I hate talking in front of people. Of course, God has a sense of humor, right? And interestingly enough, the only time I don't get nervous talking in front of people is when I'm here. You put me anywhere else, I got dry mouth, I'm scared spitless. You put me here, um, I'm, 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 I'm as happy as a clam. I don't even like clams. But that gives me the chance to say to my boys as they get older, um, your daddy doesn't do something because he's good at it. It's because God called him to it. And that's where the Lord wants to lead each and every one of you. Not into something you're good at, not into something you're confident in or capable of, but something that man, God made you able to do it. So what's your next step?